everyone, today I want to chat about my job and the details of my experience as a young professional so far. I work as a student actuary, but a lot of people are not familiar with what that actually means. What actually is an actuary? I last made a video in August 2020 about my graduate actuarial job, but that was a long time ago. I hadn't actually started the job at that stage. And I like to think that I'm a little bit more informed now with a couple of years experience. This video has actually been in the works for a long time. I first asked for questions for it on my Instagram back in February and I just never got around to filming. Thank you so much to everyone who did send in questions at the start of the year to help guide this conversation. Follow my Instagram as well if you don't already, it's at underscore page underscore why. I also want to emphasize that as always, all views expressed in this video are my own and not those of my employers or clients. And before we get started, I'd like to introduce the sponsor of today's video, Incogni. There are hundreds of data brokers out there who possess your personal information. That could be your full name, your address, your phone number, your relatives, and they aggregate it and sell it on to unknown businesses for their own benefit. Almost everyone gets regular robocalls these days where data brokers have sold your phone number to companies who use them to create call lists. Some data brokers even sell your information to scammers who use it to target victims with fake prizes. But you have the right to protect your privacy and request data brokers to delete your personal information. It would take years to do this yourself manually, but the Incogni team can speed the process up, they can handle any objections from the data brokers side, and they'll keep you updated with the progress along the way. I've got my Incogni dashboard up on my laptop right now. All I had to do was create an account and then I also had to grant Incogni the right to work for me. You can check out Incogni by clicking the link in the description box below and the first 100 people to use the code PAGEY will get 20% off. Now let's get into the actuary Q&A. Someone has asked, could you explain what an actuary actually does? I still don't get it. And I had lots of similar questions and comments. One person said, I honestly still don't understand what your job is. And I hear you guys, so let's do a quick high level recap. I work in the insurance industry as a trainee actuary. Most people are familiar with the concept of insurance. If lots of people are exposed to the same risk, for example, damaging your car and needing expensive repairs, then you can pull that risk together in order to reduce the risk. The policy holder will pay a premium to the insurer on the terms that the insurer will cover financial losses caused by a specified event happening in the future. In the motor insurance example, I pay an annual premium to direct line for my car insurance and in return, should I scrape my car, I could submit a claim to direct line and they will cover all of the cost of repairs. Specifically, I work in general insurance consulting, which is basically property and casualty insurance, any insurance that is not life insurance. So far I have worked for two global consultancy companies and our clients are companies who provide insurance, both personal lines, insurance for individuals and commercial lines which is insurance for businesses. So that's the industry I work in, now where do actuaries come in? Actuaries use statistics to calculate risk and assess financial consequences. As you can imagine, there's lots of actuaries working in the insurance industry because there's risk involved. We're dealing with uncertain future events here and these events could cause financial loss. Nobody has a crystal ball. I can't tell you with certainty how many people are gonna crash their car next week and claim on their car insurance. So we have to use historical data and sophisticated models to come up with best estimates. If insurance claims and expenses exceed the premium being collected, then the insurer is making a loss and they could be in trouble. It would be pretty bad if an insurance company went bust and couldn't cover the losses they're contracted for. Actuaries help ensure that premiums are set at the appropriate rate and that the insurer has enough money set aside as reserves to pay for claims as they fall due. It's not just actuaries that work in the insurance industry though, you also have underwriters, data scientists, software developers, project managers, claims handlers. Also actuaries can work in fields outside of insurance where there is risk that has financial consequences such as pensions and investment. Okay, I think that gives you the overview to actuaries and the insurance industry. Let's move on to the next question. Someone has asked, what are my typical tasks and how much client communication do you have? Someone else asked, how much responsibility do you have now that you've got two years experience? So I thought I'd just describe some of the work I do day to day. 
Actuarial analysts are normally involved with processing large sets of data. Clients send us premiums, paid claims, incurred claims, expected reinsurance recoveries, catastrophe loss estimates, expenses, and so many other fields of data that all needs to flow into our calculation of expected future claims. As you progress, you normally get involved with assumption selections. Our models require input assumptions which we base off trends seen in historical data and expert judgment. I usually make a first attempt at assumption selections and then discuss with senior colleagues. No actuary makes the same pick, a lot of it is very judgmental and you just need to be able to justify your selection and demonstrate that it's reasonable. I also need to send emails to clients sometimes, be that data queries or results emails. A big part of being an actuary is communicating your results and methodology, often to people who don't don't have the same level of technical expertise. My emails have varied levels of oversight from senior colleagues. Some project managers prefer to read over absolutely everything sent to the client before it's sent, whereas others just let me get on with it. It also depends on the nature of the project. If it's an informal data query, it's not as important, but all results emails should always be peer reviewed. I take notes at meetings with underwriters. They'll usually shed light on any changes in strategy or changes in policy terms, which could impact future claims. Also market insights where they might be getting more or less premium for the same risk exposure in prior periods. Once we complete our analysis, I'm usually involved with drafting reports and presentations of our results. I'm now often expected to participate in results meetings with clients. I recently presented a few slides in a results meeting discussion for the first time. Within the wider team structure, I'm expected to be training new graduates and delegating some work. At my old job, there was a very large graduate intake, so I spent a lot of my time explaining concepts to graduates and then reviewing their work. All work has to be reviewed in line with professional standards. I'll chat about this later, but with so much data, it's so easy to make mistakes. You obviously can work with different types of clients. I used to specialise in Lloyds Reserving. Lloyds of London is an insurance marketplace in London formed of many syndicates who write insurance policies in property, casualty, marine, aviation, energy, motor, and lots of specialist lines as well, like kidnap and ransom or space satellites. And so the majority of time was spent on projects where Lloyd syndicates were the client. I've also done some project work for some global reinsurers where reinsurance is insurance for insurers. Mind blowing, right? And also a captive insurer who provides insurance specifically for an affiliated business. I feel like I'm reeling off my CV here, but hopefully it's interesting. When I interned, I fell into this work and I stayed with it for a couple of years and that was doing work for an industry working party called the PPO Working Party. Look it up if you're interested, but essentially I got to present at an industry event, which was a really cool opportunity. And finally, I've had a small amount of involvement in capital modeling. Regulation means insurers have to hold a minimum amount of capital and actuaries do work to calculate what this should be, either via standard formula or through an internal model which has been approved. These internal models need to be independently reviewed and validated. And over summer I was involved with some model validation which was quite fun. In terms of next steps for me, I'd really like to be able to project manage in a year or so's time. Next questions are kind of similar. Someone asked, what's the most complicated thing you do in your job? And someone else said, what's the hardest part of your job? This is difficult to answer because I feel like every project is different and has its own challenges. However, I would say that in general, dealing with huge data sets is sometimes the most frustrating thing. It's easy to make mistakes, efficiency matters because you're under a time pressure. Everyone views data processing as the easy bit before the assumption selections, but actually you have to put a lot of time into thinking out your approach for processing the data, maybe setting up some automated processes, sense checking and cross checking output, it really requires attention to detail. The sooner we can get machines doing this stuff for us, the better, I say. If I was to describe what makes this job the most challenging though, I'd say the fact that there are so many moving pieces that can affect future claims development. There are so many factors to consider when setting assumptions. Inflation levels, particularly at the moment, changes in business mix, there might be one-off events that have distorted historical patterns. We like to look at benchmark data from similar business, 
Sometimes there's changes in internal claims processing. Premium rate change is always something to be aware of where there's changes in supply and demand, meaning insurers can charge more or less for the same policies. Each different line of business, of which there are literally hundreds, have different characteristics in their claims development to consider. Each company has its own unique reinsurance arrangements. And sometimes you're not aware of any of this stuff unless you ask the client the right question. It's all just quite a lot to take in. And I'd say the job requires a combination of really strong technical mathematical skills and really strong industry knowledge. And some people are better at that combo than others. Next question is, does your job feel repetitive or do you have a nice variety? The methodology remains broadly the same between quarterly or annual reviews. So it can feel a tad repetitive, However, I have worked on a range of projects with a variety of characteristics, different lines of business, a captive insurer versus a regulator versus a Lloyd syndicate. And so I guess I get variety that way. There's also always new curveballs to deal with each review. For example, excess inflation or losses caused by the COVID pandemic or losses caused by the Ukraine war. I'd say there's a lot to get involved in, always new streams of work developing like climate change consulting, where natural catastrophes which cause insurance losses are all increasing in frequency and severity like earthquakes, floods, wildfires, hurricanes, and then insurers also have carbon zero commitments to meet. Then there's machine learning in reserving. Maybe I should be scared that my job's gonna disappear in a few years time. I think my view on it all is stay on the pulse with the upcoming tech. Moving on to study now, because that is the other big part of my young professional life at the moment. The first question is, are actuarial exams hard? Some people label them as the most challenging exams they've ever sat. And yes, they do have a reputation for being quite rigorous. The exam pass rates are quite low for some subjects. I actually think the pass rate was 20% or something crazy like that for one of the exams in this sitting just gone. So yes, they're hard and not everyone makes it through them. So far, I've found the content of the exams easier than university exams, but the real challenge here is studying for them alongside work. And as I'll go on to describe later, they do require quite a big time commitment. Next question is how many days of study leave do you get for each subject? Study allowances vary by company, but I get 40 study days per year and I think that's pretty standard. There are two sittings per year, so I get roughly 20 study days per sitting if I split them evenly. We're normally expected to space these study days throughout the year though, so you would never take more than one study day per week, with the exception of exam week, where I normally take two days in a row off before an exam. They do this because obviously all the student actuaries have client commitments and they have employers and you can't just draw your work. You can take exams at your own pace, but currently I'm aiming for around four per year. Subjects vary in size, so the amount of days I spend on each subject isn't split evenly. You do have to do weekend and evening study when exams get close and that's in addition to your study days. The IFOA who set the exams have a recommended number of study hours for each subject on their website. They recommend 250 hours for each core exam and 400 hours for one of the exams, CP1. If I convert that to days, 250 hours divided by seven, if we say a seven hour working day, that's 36 days that the IFOA recommend you spend per core exam. And if I only get 40 study days per year and I want to sit four of these exams per year, you can see that a lot of your spare time does go into studying. Someone asked how many exams are there to take? How many do you have left? There are 13 exams in total for the IFOA qualification. The IFOA is the UK professional body, but there are other professional bodies out there in the world who offer exams. For example, the SOA, the Society of Actuaries. I have passed seven IFOA exams, which means I've got six more to go. 
and the plan is to take three next sitting. One of them is a retake from an exam I failed last sitting. Then I'm taking CP1 for the first time, which is the 400 hour recommended study one. And also CB3, which is a smaller one and is also more based around coursework. And the final question on study is, does the one day a week study session affect your salary and workload in other days? It doesn't affect my salary because study days are paid leave, but hell yes, it affects my workload. Obviously, as a student actuary, you're supposed to schedule four days of client work each week rather than five days. But I swear that work just expands to fill the time you give it and it's very easy to let client work spill over into your study days. If you underestimate the time needed for a client task, cancelling your study day that week is a very tempting and easy way of getting seven hours back. I've also had quite a few occasions where when I've got a deadline and I've got a study day the next day, I'll just work really late the day before. I'll talk about work-life balance a bit more in part two of this Q&A, but I think I'm now much more conscious about setting boundaries and also prioritizing study. The best and easiest way to progress as a student actuary in your first few years is to just get through your exams. And skipping study days is just setting yourself up to fail, really. Cool, I do have tons more questions, but I think I'm gonna split this video out because otherwise it's gonna get really, really long. If you do have more questions, pop them in the comment section below. There's still so, so much to learn. I've only been working in the industry for two years. Please give the video a like if you enjoyed it. Subscribe to my channel, follow my Instagram, follow my LinkedIn, subscribe to my newsletter, and I'll see you guys soon with another video. Bye.